What's going on, everyone? My name is Jonathan. I'm joined by Tim Collins today, and we are here to discuss the newest Marvel movie that just dropped. Hot off the press, Tim. Hot off the press. Marvel's The Eternals. I had low expectations for this movie when I went to go see it because a lot of the uh, the ratings coming in from the critics on Rotten Tomatoes were starting. This is Marvel's first movie that's below 50% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is a big deal. I think before this, the lowest was like six in the high 60 percentile, which means that 60% of the critics like the other movies. So that means less than half the critics like this film. I will say that I actually liked it, Tim, believe it or not. I, uh, <laughs> I was shocked. I, I mean, like, I expected not to like this movie, but I liked it. I mean, I could get really, really, really nitpicky with certain details. Like, yeah, sure, there wasn't enough action maybe in some areas, but I liked the action that we got. I mean, like, I couldn't believe that I liked this movie. I liked Angelina Jolie's performance. She looked great. She Her character was, was cool and awesome. There was a, a curveball from left field there about Icarus being a villain in the end, which for me, I was like, hey, you know, it. what, what are your thoughts? Give, tell me what you thought, Tim, overall. What do you think? Okay, so first of all, I'm not on the same timbre as other MCU nuts. I have heard several MCU nuts use the dirty H word to describe this movie and say that they absolutely hated it. Okay. Okay. I'm not, I'm not on that ledge because for me to hate something, it has to be something that I was emotionally involved in to begin with. If, if you make a bad Spider-Man movie, for example, I can say I hated Spider-Man three. Okay. And, yeah. and that that's kind of where I stand on this movie. I wasn't a huge fan of the source material anyway. All right. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the source material, basically this was a Jack Kirby project. All right. He started this when he was at Marvel originally. All right. It never got picked up for publication when he was originally there. He carried this with him when he left Marvel and went to D.C. All right. And he, he tried to get it published there. It got canceled during publication there. He brought it back to Marvel and he relaunched it, retitled it. OK. And then it, it actually did get published. And shortly after it was published, it was canceled with tons of loose ends. OK, so and, and the reasoning behind it was a lot of the same reasoning that I think a lot of people aren't going to like this movie. People never really had a clamoring for the story. The characters were kind of rehashes of other characters. The um, the timeline and the storyline were very confusing. A lot of things like that, that people just didn't want to dive into. I mean, people would rather just have something that's linear. So that's kind of the reason that it never had a fan following in the um in in the comic books when we when we found out we were going to get this movie i think a lot of us thought to ourselves that's kind of an interesting choice you know because there are a lot of marvel rosters that were up for grabs why did we choose this one it kind of feels like the mcu wanted to do a little bit of a tribute to jack kirby which was which was kind of interesting um and so they decided to do eternals and then right after Eternals got cast, okay, when they already picked up a big cast because they knew they had to have a big cast to bring people in, right? They picked up Angelina Jolie, Kit Harington, Richard Madden, and uh, Selma Hayek. I mean, they, they brought, you know, Bill Skarsgård. They brought a lot of people on board that they knew were going to sell tickets, all right? And th so, so they signed all these people. And then as soon as they signed all this, this huge cast to this big deal for this movie, then they get the deal done with Fox and they get the rights to X-Men and the Fantastic Four. <laughs> so it was kind of just weird timing that worked out that we ended up getting this movie. So 
uh, here, here's kind of my line of thinking. My, my big thing is that this whole thing felt forced. It did not feel like a natural flow to the MCU. It did not really mesh with the storyline. It didn't really mesh with the timeline. It didn't really mesh with the previous contingencies that we already have in the MCU. If you're going to introduce something that's not well known, it at least needs to be fluid to the story that we have to this point. And I just don't feel like they did that. I feel like there's a lot of open holes and a lot of gaps that are kind of unexplained and kind of inexplicable. Just the fact that that all that throughout history they've been fighting these deviant characters and nobody was ever able to dig up record of them was kind of weird you know what i mean you don't think the avengers would have known about them somehow you don't think i mean all of this it would have been really weird whenever you have a roster group like this and it's introduced to you very quickly i feel like the the directing style and a lot of that they they tried to get us emotionally involved in these characters to the point where we really cared whether or not they survived, whether or not they died. And, and I just could not have cared less because I just did not, I just did not have any emotional attachment to these characters previously coming in. And then I was introduced to these characters very quickly. And, and now all of a sudden I'm supposed to care if, if a bunch of them died. Uh, it was, it was just really, it was just really weird. There were multiple deaths that were unnecessary. I don't think, I don't think that the deaths that they had really added to the story um, you know, and, and they were characters, quite frankly, that I think would have been, they would have been interesting for the roster if it was sustaining moving forward. I guess the only good news about it is that means that they're probably not planning on doing another Eternals movie, but I, I just, you know, I just did not, I did not understand that. By the end, half the roster was bad guys. I mean, it, it felt to me like that episode of The Office, the murder episode, where it's like Michael and Andy and, you know, My Michael and Andy and, and Dwight are all standing there and they're all double agents. You know what I mean? That's kind of how it felt. It's just like the Celestials are bad guys and Icarus is a bad guy and Sprite's a bad guy and everybody's a bad guy. It was it was just ridiculous on its face. And, and don't get me wrong. I, I know that predictable storylines are one that nobody loves, but th there is such a thing as too many heel turns. And I think this I, I do think that this movie was flirting with that. So that's part of, that's part of it that I didn't like at all. Oh, come on um, though. The, the only two bad guys were Sprite and Icarus really. I mean, yeah, sure. You know, kind I, of Ajax, kind of Ajax. And of course the Celestials, which we all knew uh, were bad guys anyway. Yeah. The but, Celestials, but we knew that was coming. We, though. We, we knew that anyway, but if you didn't know the source material, you wouldn't have known that. And it kind of would have taken you by surprise. And so I, you know, to me, if, if anybody was coming into this movie, fresh they they really would have probably been like so who isn't a bad guy now you know what i mean and so it was kind of it was kind of a weird choice kind of an interesting direction to go and then on on top of all that i just felt like the animation was not up to the marvel standard particularly bill skarsgård's uh, deviant character that reminded me so much of steppenwolf in the face just the poor animation quality it was really bad i, I did not care for that Pip at the very end, I could tell that was a late ad because that was no good. The animation was terrible there. Um, if, if you're Disney and you're in, your bread and butter is animation, you got to do better than that, man. Okay, especially if you've had you've had so much time to put this movie together because it got delayed by what a year. You've had so much time to put this movie together. You got to tighten up the bolts on things like that. I do agree with you on one thing. I think the only character that had staying power the whole time was Thena. I think that I think that Angelina Jolie's character and her portrayal of Thena was fantastic. I feel like that was the one eternal that felt to me like she could compete with anybody that we've seen in the MCU. It, it was, it was a fantastic, uh, it was a fantastic portrayal. She's obviously very powerful and very skilled. And I feel like she did a great job acting in that as well. I did like the introduction of the black Knight. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not sold that that's going to like redeem this movie. The fact that they just briefly mentioned the black Knight in this movie, but that, that is something that I, really did like that they were going to introduce yeah. probably the, and probably one of the biggest problems I had with the movie was this okay and and you Jonathan Mr. I bring a Superman poster to a Marvel podcast are going to laugh at this as well a Superman reference in the middle of a Marvel movie are you kidding me 
a Superman movie in the are, are we plugging DC now? Are you serious? What? <laughs> hey, look. you gotta be kidding me, man. Okay, so, there's anyway. so much to unpack, Tim. I even okay. lost a couple of the points that I was gonna make, like an <laughs> argument, because you literally reviewed the whole entire film. Uh, okay, let's talk about the Superman thing first because that's okay. freshness on my brain. Okay, Su- Superman, okay, whatever. You know, like honestly, when you have successful movies on DC. It makes the Marvel movies even more successful. Just because Marvel movies are 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 doing good doesn't mean that the failures of DC make it do even better. If DC puts out a great movie, the general audience doesn't see a DC or Marvel movie like us. They see a comic book movie. So if it's a piece of crap, then they might say, well, you know what? The last two comic book movies I went to go see were crap. I'm not going to go see another comic book movie. But... Little did they know that they were both DC movies. So the general movie going audience, unlike the little bubble that you and I live in, they don't know the difference between DC and Marvel. All they know is, oh, this is a comic book movie. Okay. Uh, this is the Justice League. Is Iron Man in this? That's yeah, literally when's questions. Time, when's the last time you saw a Pepsi commercial and they're like, you know what? Coke's pretty good. I think Coke's different. Awesome. It's different though, yeah, man. Give me a break. Give hey, me a break, man. Tim, <laughs> people don't know the difference between DC and Marvel. Uh, I am not kidding you, Tim. I, I know. Dad, whenever I explain to him, like for five minutes, I know. I know this. I know this. <laughs> I know so, this. So yeah, why would you expect him to know? Like, it's it's not like the difference between Coke and Pepsi. So that's my argument. When, when Superman does well, so does the Avengers. When Wonder Woman does well, you know, it, it, they only benefit from doing, from putting out good products. So when they have a little, a little nod to Superman in there, I didn't, that didn't bother me. You said it was almost like they forced this, this movie out into the ether, right? Yeah. yeah. First of all, I know that Kevin Feige has got a five-year plan in place. Every movie, every character that they introduce is for a reason. We'll and <laughs> the Celestials being introduced, the Eternals then, being introduced. The Celestials are huge. I get it. I get it. The Celestials are huge. I totally agree with you there. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and here's the thing. They're setting up Galactus, Tim. They're setting, they've already opened up the, we've already gotten multiverse, 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 Celestial. What's, what's coming next? Come on, well, Tim. Of course, of course, they're setting up Galactus. We all know this because we all know the plan for Fantastic Four, which is coming down the road here. Okay, and and we know that when you get when you get Fantastic Four, you get Silver Surfer. When you get Silver Surfer, you get Galactus. All this is, you know, we get all of this. But the the thing that just kills me with the thing that just kills me with it is once again, it's kind of interesting because there's so many smart people in the MCU, right? There's so many smart people. There's so many people with, with tons of resources, you know, I mean, how long, let me just give you, I'll just give you one example. And I know it's not exactly the same thing, but do you remember how long it took Tony Stark to find out that Peter Parker was Spider-Man? He's just like, this is you, right? Okay. I mean, yeah, you don't think that he has any archived history of people who have been saving the saving the world for 7,000 years, and he can go and say, hey, this is you, right? I mean, come on. You know, I mean, I, I, they, you don't have be, footage. You, know. you don't have footage of anything from the 1500s. I understand that. But the last you time have, that they you had don't think a, there's any recorded history of it at all anywhere that he might have resources. The for last them. time that they were public publicly like saving people was the 1500s. So, no, there was no cameras back in the 1500s, Tim. <sighs> All right. Well, we're we're going to agree to disagree on this point. Okay, <laughs> we're going to agree to disagree on this point. Just there are so many contingencies within the MCU. Okay, it's not just that. Okay, there are so many contingencies set up within the MCU where it's like the 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 timeline has to mesh, the reasoning has to mesh. I still don't think the reasoning is meshing. All right, I I understand the thing about the Celestials telling them only to fight the Deviants and all that kind of stuff. I'm not getting it, okay? Because they didn't obey it, okay? We know that, right? They didn't obey it. They went ahead and they went against it anyway. So why in the world wouldn't they step in and help against Thanos? Why in the world wouldn't they step in and help when the world was ending three other times? It just doesn't make any sense, okay? When you have contingencies that are in place throughout the whole MCU, they have to be considered. That's the one thing I liked about Guardians, okay? I was not, I was not familiar with Guardians coming in, but when it came in, it, it was very fluid with the story that had already been introduced. And that's what made it, that's what made it so much easier to go with than this. <clears throat> this just kind of feels, it feels like square peg round hole. That's the way it just felt for me the whole time. 
Because <laughs> even in 2016, 2017, no, 2016's Guardians 2, we got a little taste of Celestials. You know, we got a little sure. taste of, 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 sure. of that world building. And I feel like that's what they're doing with this film too. You know, we already started breaking into the multiverse. We got a little bit of Ego, the living planet. So what makes sense to introduce next? Let's introduce the Celestials. We've already talked about them in the, guard, not just the second Guardians film, but the first one too. We, we talked about the Infinity Stones and, and, and even Peter Quill is half Celestial, right? Because his dad was a Celestial. Sure. And that's why he was able to hold the Power Stone for a bit. Chronologically, and, and from what we've gotten so far, I think it meshes really well. And uh, I think that the direction that we're going, <laughs> it, it makes perfect sense. We'll disagree on this one. We're not going to change each other's mind, Jonathan. That's just all True. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to change there's, your mind. but There's the one of us that's right, and there's the one of us that's wearing the red shirt. I get it. It's okay. I will agree with you on the post credit sequence that – the uh, I didn't have a problem with the CGI of the Deviants. It wasn't the best CGI ever, but not many movies are. You know, I think when I think of that, I think of okay, Thanos and Endgame, and I think of uh, you know, the whole even the Hulk in the first Avengers film looked top notch. The Deviants I didn't have that big of a problem with, but the the Pip at the in the uh, post credit sequence looked terrible. It looked like yeah. PlayStation Two graphics. I and I and I didn't even. It wasn't even really the 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 thing about Pip. I'm almost willing to forgive Pip because I can tell that they just realized they're like we got to throw Pip in here, Pip and Pip and Ther and Eros in here just just because. And so they just. I mean, even Eros's costume looked like it was from the Walmart Halloween rack. I didn't get that, but all of a sudden it was just like, okay, we got these two characters, we got to throw in there. So I was almost willing to forgive that because it wasn't a big part of the movie. The deviants in general, I didn't have a problem with, okay, the way that they were portrayed. But Bill Skarsgård's deviant character is the one that, to me, was very, very poor, poorly done, all right? His face and the way that he had everything, was it, it just did not look, it did not look like the Marvel standard that we're used to. That's just me. I know a lot of people, you know, a lot of people might be like, ah, oh, you're kind of nitpicking there, but to me, that was that was just a total swing and a miss because he was actually a relatively big character. So it it was kind of a it was kind of a big fail to me. Once again, that's just me. And then we also had the the second post credit sequence. I'm sure you stuck around for that too mm -hmm. in the theaters. Of course, uh, it's every time I'm in the the movie theater and my wife is. I, know. I don't know why, but she that's always why I go asks by me. Myself. The, she always asks me the myself. same thing. Like she's always like, "Hey, you ready to go?" And I'm like. No. <laughs> Do you not know this is a Marvel movie? And then after the first post credit credit sequence is over, like half the theater leaves, and I'm always like, I'm thinking to myself, like noobs, you know, like yeah, yeah. They don't know. But anyway, second post credit sequence, we get a voice in the background, Tim. Mm -hmm. Do you know whose voice that was? It's Blade, right? Mahershala yeah. Ali's Blade. Yeah. I that's the the reason I knew exactly who it was mm -hmm. right away because his mm -hmm. voice is very distinct. Yep. He's the one that played Cottonmouth in Cottonmouth, uh, yep. Luke Cage. On, on Luke Cage, yep. So uh, when I heard that voice, I don't think anybody else in the theater picked up on it, but I'll. that was the first time, Tim. Hey, yep. I'm starting to become a true comic book fan, okay? Mm -hmm. Initially, sure. back in 2012, when, when we first saw Thanos, I didn't know who that was. But yeah. I'm starting to do my research and read about things that have to do with this and that. Not saying I read a ton of comic books, uh, because I don't. But... I felt very proud of myself whenever I knew that that was Mahershala Ali's blend. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, that was a very good. Um, it was a very interesting addition because the the Black Knight um, and Blade. I I don't really know a lot of a, a lot of the history between those two, so I don't think they're really characters that kind of interacted a lot. So that would you know I, maybe I'm completely wrong on that. I'm not overwhelmingly familiar with either character. I just know that the Black Knight generally is considered somebody that was in the late 70s on the roster of the Avengers. So um so that's something that was kind of interesting to me. It would make sense for he and Blade to be together. <laughs> so I think that that would be kind of interesting. But yeah, I uh I was really happy to hear that as well. Something else that was that just kind of bothered me about the Eternal and kind of what I was expecting, which is probably, I should have just not expected it. But one of the big things is uh, in the history of, of Eternals, when Jack set this up, one of the big things that, that took place was when the Celestials originally experimented on humans, 
that's what opened up the door to mutation in humans. I was kind of wanting an allusion or a reference to that at some point, and we didn't quite get that. That was kind of one of those things I was kind of waiting on it. I was waiting on a human to kind of be like, I was waiting on someone that we knew was human to have some kind of a reaction to, you know, to the celestials having been around or, or having experimented or something like that, or, or, or seeing, you know, they did so many flashback sequences. I was looking for something like that and it just never happened. So that's kind of, that's kind of something else I was kind of hoping for. Um, I know that Marvel is just taking their time with this. They're taking their time with, but they, they, they've done so much teasing and trolling with the fan base on, on the X-Men stuff. You know, they've introduced us to Mad Rapport and they've introduced, you know, so many other. Hey, Kevin Feige told us back in whenever they acquired the rights, I think that was 2018. Yeah. People asked him, Hey, are we going to get an X-Men movie soon? He was like, Nope. It's going to yeah, be five years from and, now. And, yeah. and I'm not asking for, for a movie soon. Okay. All I'm asking for is the proper setup to the movie. Okay. Because what I don't want is for us to drop in a bunch of characters again and say, boom, they've been here the whole time and you're going to be cool with it. That's what they did with this movie. And I was like, okay. So, so that's kind of what I would like is some kind of a little build up to it. And I didn't get that from this. So that was, that was the one thing I was looking for that I was like, well, if I hate the movie and they do that, I can at least go away from it, <laughs> but I just couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I, I, I can't, I can't do that. I get, yeah. I mean, like, you know, and, and sometimes, sometimes we can all do that, right? We have a set of expectations in our brain. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if they don't go somewhere narratively that we expect them to go, or we don't expect, well, we don't get the characters that we wanted to see or various different things. Sometimes that can ruin a movie for us. And, and I don't know, I don't know if it's a good thing that we do that or a bad thing, but we do that. We all have a set of expectations in our brain before we go see a movie. I don't know. Maybe that's why I found myself enjoying this movie because my expectations were not only low, Tim, but I'm honestly like, I honestly expected to hate this movie. I was like, you know, the yeah. critic score on Rotten Tomatoes low. Uh, there's not much buzz on the film. You know, I just don't think I'm going to like this movie very much. And I was really pleasantly surprised. I thought it was very unique you know, you, you kind of have a blueprint for most Marvel movies that you see a lot and they didn't go by that blueprint, which was refreshing to me. You know, it was something different and unique. It wasn't like a giant beam going in the sky at the end of the movie. I mean, it was, you know, like a completely different narratively, you know, like you said, you didn't like all the heel turns at the end. I, f I mean, it was only two Eternals, right? The only reason that Sprite ended up going with Icarus is because that apparently she had this uh, infatuation with him or whatever. And, wish that she could be, you know, uh, a real girl now or whatever, you know, but I didn't have a problem with that at the end. I mean, it made sense to me. Like initially, whenever Sprite first left with Icarus, I was like, why did she do that? But I felt like they did a good job of explaining right away. Like, you know, oh, it's because, you know, she has this thing and they planted the seed for, for that earlier in the film too. Mm -hmm. So Tinkerbell. Um, when she's Tinkerbell, right? Yeah. When she's but, Tinkerbell. Yeah. So, but I mean, I I think the, the real interesting thing about Sprite, and I think the reason, this is one of the reasons that, that the movie is kind of still on my lower tier. Sprite, to me, had staying power, okay? She, she could have been someone that had staying power in the MCU moving forward, and they kind of decided to take that and go a completely different direction with it. I think that Sprite, deep down, was one of the most important members of the Eternals, and nobody looks at that because she wasn't the most powerful, but what she was capable of doing to help the others succeed was so important. And that's something that could have been a great, and, and she had just, she, she had an infectious personality, something that you just love to watch when she's on screen. Okay. So yeah, but she couldn't stay like, like, like a little girl forever. So I, I understand. I understand. I, I understand that as well. Okay. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying to never do this, but to do it in the first movie, is, you know, and not even give her, I mean, the, the MCU is something that carries on for years and years, not even give her the possibility of, of, of being, you know, an eternal later on. That was just kind of weird to me. So um, I didn't- the next didn't time they that. film, she's going to look way different. Uh, and it's going to well, be I, obvious. I, and I understand, but I mean, take a look at, take a look at the Spider-Man cast. They, they somehow can make every single one of those kids still look like they're in high school, even though they're in their twenties now. <laughs> They're late 20. So it's just, you know, it's it just it's just all in their their commitment to their craft and whether or not they're willing to put on the weight, take off the weight, 
um, you know, stay the same size and 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 do the cinematography necessary. It's all that, but but you she know, was I, like a, I mean, she was like a little girl. She wasn't yeah. like a high schooler. I mean, exactly. she's like a twelve year old. She was maybe fourteen, I think, maybe yep. at the most, you know. And she's, but she was she did she did a very good job, and I think that that was a very interesting that was a very interesting direction to go. The other thing was was Icarus just flying into the sun. I I I did not care for that. Um, that that was just me. I. I, I didn't care for that. I, I would have, if he would have just like disappeared or something, but flying into the sun, I was kind of like, that's kind of weird. That's kind of interesting. That's what Icarus so, did though in, the, in, in Greek mythology, right? I know, I know. Flying too close to the sun and it all melts. And yeah, well, I, hey, I think they did that to leave it open-ended because we might or might not see Icarus return. I yeah, think and Marvel did that because they could always go back in the sequel or, or the next movie that he's going to be in and say, oh, well, he didn't fly into the sun. He just flew he just, close. He lives on the sun. You know, he just. <laughs> so so yeah. they left it open ended, which I sure. get, you know, like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. The fact that Icarus was a villain at first, I thought that I didn't like that. But, you know, the more I thought about it and as I was driving home from my long trip back from the theater, I didn't mind it that much. I mean, overall, man. I kept thinking you're you're gonna think I'm crazy. You're gonna think that that I've lost I've went off my rocker. I've I, I already think that. <laughs> but I give this movie an eight, man, an eight out of ten. What? what? An eight out of ten? Are it was so kidding? unique. The action was fun. Every character got a moment to shine in the spotlight. Uh, every character was unique. They didn't go by that. Uh, and I'm not saying I don't like movies that go by the Marvel formula or the blueprint. But it was refreshing to see something so different and so unexpected. And there was a lot, I mean, there was just a lot to enjoy, in my opinion. I thought it was beautifully directed. The story was great. It introduced us as casual audience members as well as they could to the concept of a celestials and eternals. And, and I think that it's when we look back four or five years from now, we're going to say, oh, that movie was absolutely necessary to get us ready for what was to come. And I think that Kevin Feige knows that. And, and honestly, I, I understand, especially like, you know, someone in your shoes or even, you know, like my, my twin brother or my variant might hate this movie, but I like it. Gotcha. I get yeah, it. I, like, that's what I'm trying to say. Like if somebody else doesn't like this movie, I get it. You know, yeah. my wife was kind of 50, 50 on it. And she said that she honestly felt like, some of the characters didn't all get a, their moment in the spotlight, but I mm -hmm. disagreed. So, I mean, I, I would say there are a couple of things that I, there are a couple of things that, that I don't really care for in, in, uh, in the Eternals that I didn't get to. One, one of the things is how the Celestials would create these, these beings, but make all of them with certain handicaps, right? Um, make one of them deaf, make one of them a child, you know, that those are, those are kind of things that don't really make sense. If you're going to make a super team to go fight these, these deviants, they, they should kind of all be cut from a, a, a very similar mold. And they really weren't, which was very interesting. At the very least, what they could have done is if, if they're going to make this the tribute to Jack Kirby, you need to make it the tribute to his design and his artwork and all that kind of stuff. And none of that was there. So that that's kind of that's kind of the other thing. It's like, you know, this wasn't an overwhelmingly popular story in the books anyway. So I didn't really expect to love the story. But at the very least, could I love the costumes? Could I love the effects? Could I love the design? Could I love the cinematography? Could I love something about it? Um, you know, you I love the cinematography. I, I, it was, it was okay, I guess. I mean, it just did not, I mean, I, I guess I just didn't like the story enough to get invested in it. I, I just, I don't know. It was, there was just a lot that I just did not care for. Ironically enough, I think, like I said, I think my favorite characters, my two favorite characters, and I think one of them has staying power is Stina. I think Druig was a good character as well. I don't see him really having any other impact on the MCU. So we'll just, we'll just see about that. But I just, I don't know, man. Uh, overall, if you were to ask me to give it a rating, I'd probably, I'd probably put it somewhere between five, five and a half. That's on the lower tier of where I've rated Marvel films before. Not, and once again, it's not, I, I want to be very clear, just because I'm critical of the film does not mean that I hated the film. I'm not like a lot of my cohorts in the crazy MCU universe that that will tell you that they, you know, there are movies that they love, there are movies that they hate, and there's no difference between the two. Uh, you, you know, that that's it, just the two extremes. I'm not like that. I, I did not hate this movie, okay? 
it just was not one of my favorite MCU films, and I have qualms about its consistency. That's pretty much it. Fair enough, man. Hey, that's the beauty of film, and that's the beauty of how <laughs> unique we are. We all are as individuals. Where we watch a movie, and 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 you know, you see one thing, I see another thing, and someone else may see something completely different. We film is subjective. Mm -hmm. Just because I like it doesn't mean I'm right or wrong. And just because you didn't love it doesn't mean you're right or wrong. You know, it's just, sure. we all have different opinions. We're different people. Sure. Maybe we're all just robots like the Eternals, Tim. <laughs> Deep down inside. We're all programmed to do it this way, right? Yep. Thank you so much for joining me today on this discussion slash review, Tim. Now, I really appreciate it. You're always a great guest on the show. You're welcome back anytime. Folks, thank you for watching. If you uh, haven't already, check us out on Instagram. We're at Real Comic Book Cinema. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Hit that like button. It helps us out a lot. And until next time, everyone, have a great and wonderful weekend.